I invite you to open a Bible, if you will, with me back to 1 John chapter 1, where we will be reading together in just a little while. 1 John 1, toward the end of our New Testaments, I'll give you plenty of time to turn back there. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm not worthy. That is not a pleasant thing to feel, is it? That is a very real and troubling thing to feel in various circumstances of life. What do you do when you don't feel worthy? It's one thing not to feel worthy to be admitted into a particular university or to have a particular job or to be told that you are being promoted and to feel very unworthy and inadequate of the added pressures and responsibilities. It's one thing to feel unworthy to be married to someone or to have the parents or the upbringing that you had. We understand uh, how serious it is to feel unworthy in those sorts of things. How much more when it comes to the things of God. What do you do when you feel unworthy to gather in a setting like this? What do you do when you feel unworthy to pray? What do you feel, what do you do when you hear the good news of salvation and the opportunity for forgiveness and reconciliation to God, but you can't even get past the feelings of unworthiness to respond to the message of the gospel. There have been many, many sincere and very well-meaning people who have said because they felt unworthy. I'm not worthy. And so what do you do when you feel unworthy in relation to what matters most? Could I suggest to you, first of all, we must begin with the root. Just as something cannot be undone that is not first done, I cannot feel unworthy in relation to God without at least some sense of the fact there is someone who is worthy and that is the one we have been singing about throughout our time together already this morning. We are assured in Psalm 18 and verse 3, the Lord is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be called upon. He is the one who saves from our enemies. The great anthem is sounded in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things and by your will they existed and were created. That is the root cause as to why there are people on every continent throughout this world, nearly every country throughout this world, in one way or another, who are offering their praises to God. He is worthy. Our Creator, His Son, our Savior, is worthy. The anthem continues in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Just as something cannot be undone that was not first done, the root of feeling unworthy is the fact that someone truly is. That's why we're here. And we are not the first to feel unworthy in His presence. John the Baptist, 
In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, speaking of Jesus who was to come, said, I am not worthy to carry his sandals. Peter, when he came face to face with who this Jesus of Nazareth truly was, felt unworthy to be in the same boat as Jesus. Depart from me was his plea, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. A Roman centurion even coming face to face with the true identity of this Jesus of Nazareth was willing to say, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Where does that come from? You have your Bibles open there to 1 John chapter 1, which introduces to us the facts behind our unworthiness. Here is the reality. The root is someone is worthy. The reality is I am unworthy. And here is the reason. 1 John chapter 1, begin reading with me in verse 8. 1 John 1 and verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If John the Baptist was unworthy to carry his sandals, if Peter was not worthy of being in the same boat, if the Roman centurion was not worthy of having the Lord come into his house, neither are we. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But here are the facts behind the reality of our unworthiness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Open your Bibles with me back to the book of Acts chapter 7. Who felt that reality of unworthiness more keenly than Saul of Tarsus? We talked last Sunday morning about our God's amazing ability to flip the switch and to take things that were exceedingly dark in the moment as far as human beings are concerned, this must be the end. This is the dead end. This is the corner that we cannot get out of. But how over and over and over again we see God able to take the darkest, most dire of circumstances and work them together for good. Here is another example in Acts chapter 7. Stephen, a man who is fervent in his belief that Jesus is the Son of God, willing to stand before the very authorities that were instrumental in the murder of the Son of God outside of the walls of of Jerusalem. Here is Stephen in the very same city. And he's led his audience to the conclusion, just as your forefathers would not listen to the prophets sent by God, you have shown yourself ultimately stubborn in rejecting God's own son. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 7 and verse 54, when these Jewish authorities hear these things, they are enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and they threw rocks at him until he died. The witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, just as Jesus had cried out as well. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And that young man who was watching, guarding the coats, he approved. I want you to think for a moment before we read any further what Jesus had told his apostles. That they were to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And then they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We've gone through Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And we're still right here in Jerusalem. But we are dealing with the God who is able to flip the switch. The God who is perfectly aware of the fact that there arises a great persecution on that day against the church in Jerusalem. And they're all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men bury Stephen and they make great lamentation over him. Saul, but Saul is ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. And so those who are scattered, they go all over. And what do they do as they scatter? They preach the word. Meanwhile, Saul is barging into people's houses and raging like a a wild animal against this Jesus movement. In his own words, years later, he recounts in Acts chapter 26 and verse 9, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so. In Jerusalem, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues. I tried to make them blaspheme. You just imagine what this man did in an effort to get believers to curse the name of God. Saul of Tarsus says, I did that. In raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. We continue reading in the book of Acts and we find that he has an encounter with the risen, glorified Son of God and he falls to his knees and he asks, Lord, what would you have me do? And Jesus tells him to go into the Damascus, into the very city to which he was traveling to persecute Christians. And there he would be told what he must do. And he's called, he, he receives that call that you're going to go into this Gentile world and you're going to proclaim this news that you've so vigorously been trying to stamp out. Let me ask you, the first time that the former soul of Tarsus sat with his new brothers and sisters in Christ and observed the Lord's Supper, how worthy do you think he felt? Can you imagine being a a younger person who had watched as this man barged into your parents' house and drug off your father and mother? And to this day, you have no idea what happened to them. They never came home. And now this man, Saul of Tarsus, is sitting beside you. singing praises about the risen Son of God along with you. How worthy would you think he was? It is no wonder that this man would later write in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, I am the least of the apostles. I am the least of those who have been called and sent by God. 
unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. If you're still in Acts, it's the very next book in the Bible. Romans chapter 14. The ironic thing is that God uses this man over and over and over again to communicate with his mouth and with his, his pen as he writes letters showing people, Jew and Gentile. Yes, this man may feel unworthy, and he is, but listen, we are all unworthy. God uses this man to clearly communicate that we are all in the same sinking, unworthy boat. It is Saul of Tarsus, now Paul, who writes that universal truth in Romans 3 and verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all, not just this Saul of Tarsus, we are all like that prodigal son of Jesus' parable who comes back pleading with his father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. When push comes to shove, we're not even worthy servants. Jesus in Luke 17 and verse 10, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. As to the person who might sit in an assembly right along with this former soul of Tarsus and feel pretty worthy in and of themselves, especially compared to him. We've got our Bibles open to Romans 14. God empowers and inspires this man to communicate to all, both Jew and Gentile, however they feel about themselves. In Romans 14 and verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It is written, as I live, says the Lord, who is eminently worthy, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. He is worthy. I, no matter who I am, am not. And yet, as we open our Bibles back to 1 Corinthians 11, where we'll be reading in just a few moments, the book right after the book of Romans, would you notice with me the call built on God's amazing grace? We've sung together this morning, sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life, offer pardon. And peace to all. He is worthy and we are not. And yet the wonderful words of life contain the offer of pardon and peace from the one who is eminently worthy. Listen to how he now describes those who respond to the gospel call. In Ephesians 4 and verse 1, I therefore, Paul writes, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You're unworthy of the call. I'm unworthy of answering the call. But the offer of pardon and peace has been extended and now I can walk in a manner worthy of that calling. That's Ephesians. It's in Philippians. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's in Colossians. Colossians 1 and verse 10. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I'm not worthy of that kingdom. You're not worthy of that glory 
but he, with the offer of pardon and peace, calls us into that and is willing to change our lives. Now, we've got our Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 11. One question that frequently comes up is, what about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27? When he warns us about what has, has happened to lay the basis of this offer of pardon and peace. Look at what the Son of God endured. And here is the warning in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27. That whoever eats this bread that reminds us of the body of Christ. And whoever drinks this cup of the Lord that reminds us of the blood that was shed for us. And whoever does that in an unworthy worthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Would you notice with me that Paul is not writing about how worthy these Christians are? They weren't. Any more than you and I are. He is writing to admonish them about the manner in which they are partaking of it. Listen, in just a few minutes, we will gather as ransomed sons and daughters of God, completely unworthy because of our past sins. We will gather and we will partake of this supper just as we have been commanded. But we will do that not because we are worthy. We do that because we have been unworthy we needed a savior feeling sorrow for my sin does not disqualify me from partaking of this feeling sorrow for my sin is a prerequisite for partaking of this supper if i cannot realize and admit my sinfulness my unworthiness then i have no place at the lord's table we come before him this morning confessing our unworthiness. Not feeling pretty good about ourselves saying, I think I'm worthy this week. And so what does it mean to partake of this in an unworthy manner? We lean on the context of what Paul actually writes. In 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 18, he writes about division that would lead to observing this memorial in an unworthy manner. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18, in the first place when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. He says in verse 22, what do you not have houses? to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? Were they partaking of this in a worthy manner? Absolutely not. He writes in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 20 about self-indulgence. When you come together, verse 20, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. You're not observing this in a worthy manner. In eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. He begins in verse 23 about warning that we need to do this in remembrance of the one who made this possible. Verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If I do this not proclaiming his death, I'm not doing it in a worthy manner. 
Verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If I do this without examining myself, I'm not doing it in a worthy manner. Verse 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. If I'm not discerning, reverently honoring the body and the blood of the Lord, then I'm doing this in an unworthy manner. Anyone, verse 29, who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. There are certainly other ways that we could fail to Observe this in a worthy manner. But listen, feeling sorrow because of my sins is not one of those ways. We partake of this supper not because we are worthy, but precisely because we are unworthy. You go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What then if there is ongoing unresolved sin in my life? Hence the call for self-examination. We are all unworthy. The wonderful words of life have echoed throughout history and offered peace and offered pardon. And now those who are willing to respond to that, we are called each first day of the week to remember what it took so that we, unworthy as we are, might be reconciled to the one who is imminently worthy. What if there is unresolved, ongoing sin in my life? We read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9 where Paul writes, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Keep reading. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Unworthy? Absolutely. An offer of grace from the one who is imminently worthy? Praise God, yes. Now it's up to Paul. What will I do with the offer of grace? Saul of Tarsus, unworthy as he is, says his grace toward me was not in vain. I would not squander the offer of God's grace for a moment. The grace he's willing to show me, it is not in vain. Go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 where the writer develops that if I turn my back on this sacrifice, I've turned my back on the only sacrifice sufficient to atone for my sins. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, the writer encourages Christians to listen up. What if there is ongoing unresolved sin in my life? Hebrews 10 and verse 26, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. All that is left is a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. We've studied in our Sunday morning Bible class, Moses was great, yes, but Moses was a servant. If I turn my back on the Son of God, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? I'm unworthy. And the words of life have come to my ears and into my heart. And perhaps I am completely unwilling to respond. The grace of God is 
vain as it beats on my unrepentant heart. I'm making its power vain in my life. Perhaps at one point I responded to the offer of grace and peace and pardon to all. But I just keep on sinning deliberately. The writer says what I'm doing is trampling underfoot the Son of God, profaning the blood of the covenant by which I was sanctified. I'm outraging the Spirit of grace. We know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge not just the people out there. The Lord will judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If I hear the offer of pardon and of peace, but I just continue to allow ongoing, unresolved sin to fester in my life, I am exactly where the Jews in Antioch in Acts chapter 13 were. It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside. And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Open your Bibles with me back to Romans chapter 6. How incredible that we completely unworthy, thoroughly unworthy, could be welcomed and forgiven by the one who is imminently worthy. And how tragic, because I am unwilling to turn, that I would judge myself unworthy. Listen, we have been called not to live as perpetually guilty sinners. We have been called to live as saints. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? The offer of pardon and grace has been made available. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. When we die with Christ, we die to sin. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I am unworthy to be here this morning. You are unworthy to be here this morning. And if you feel that, your heart is exactly where it ought to be. But we also are filled with joy, inexpressible, that because of the wonderful words of life and our penitent, humble response to it, now we can walk in newness of life. And so no, sin no longer has an ongoing place in our lives. Romans 6 and verse 11, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's end in the book of James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We observe this supper this morning seeking to observe in a worthy manner. Remembering what he has done for us. Proclaiming his death. Examining ourselves. Discerning, reverently honoring his body and his blood. Before we do that, Is it time for repentance? In James chapter 4 and verse 8, the offer is freely extended. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. He knows how unworthy you and I are. He is perfectly, infinitely aware of how worthy He is. 
And despite all of that, he invites you to draw near by the blood of his own son. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord. And he will exalt you. Before we remember his sacrifice, is it time to repent? As we sing about the call, the gospel call that is echoing throughout this world this morning. How is your relationship with the offerer of that call? The Son of God unashamedly said in Matthew 10 and verse 37, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We're unworthy. But we're invited to take up a cross and follow him. Taste and see that he is good. And that we're not missing out on anything. In fact, we have found what is infinitely most valuable of all. And so the offer stands as it has for nearly 2,000 years. Are you willing to confess your belief that Jesus is the Son of God? Are you willing to turn? Are you willing to be buried with Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins that you might be raised to walk in newness of life along this way full of joy and glory. If you're a child of God and you know that there is unresolved sin in your life, won't you address that even right now? If we can be of any help whatsoever, would you let us know how by coming to the front while we stand and sing?